what is up bears fans and we're back for another episode of bears banter i've got another two legends with me tonight of course i'm michael carboni great to be here with the legends gary larson mate he played for the bears from 1987 to 1999 233 games all up played for the eels as well played for queensland of course proud queenslander maybe not this week uh, but definitely a proud Aussie as well. Played for the Kangaroos from 95 to 97. Of course, Gary Larson, welcome to the show, mate. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. Right. And the other legend with us today from the other side of the world is currently in London, I believe. He played for the Bears from 88 to 94, 120 games all up. Had a career, had a few seasons with the London Broncos as well, where he was a coach. For a number of years and had some time with the Brumbies as well, I believe. So, Tony Ray, welcome to Bears Banter, buddy. Yeah, pleasure. Great to be back in the, in the Bear Camp, in the Den. Fantastic to have you guys from both sides of the world. Of course, Tony in London, Gary from far north Queensland and myself in Sydney. So, through the magic of, uh, of video, we're all here together, which is fantastic. Um, gentlemen, first question has to be, where are they now? And we kind of touched on it. Gary, we'll start with you, mate. What have you been up to since uh, since you finished with your time at, at the Bears or since your rugby league career ended? Oh, Michael, I've uh, had, a, had a few jobs since um, my career ended. Uh, I was involved in, when I, when, I, when I first finished, I was involved in uh, development with with uh, North Sydney with the ARL and was uh, based in the North Sydney Junior region. Uh, I did that for a couple of years. Hung around the Leagues Club, worked in the gym, which is where I originally worked when I first come to North Sydney, was in the in the gym and looked after the temple that I did have, and um, which is the body, as they call it. And um, oh, <laughs> that, that, that was a temple. That my yeah. <laughs> work it, work it. Still is a temple too, I might add. But no, uh, worked in the gym for many years, mate, with a, a, a very good man, Peter Harford, who's like a second father to myself. And actually, you know, uh, so yeah, was in the gym for quite a while, over my playing career until about 95. And then we all went fully, you know, fully professional. Uh, so yeah, uh, went back. To working in the gym in 2003, 2003 to about 2007. Then I moved up to Gladstone. This is where I'm from, Gladstone in Queensland. And um, I worked in a sports store for 12 months, then got out and did a bit of labouring for 12 months. So about 2008, I got a job in the coal industry. And um, I'm working at a place called the Gladstone Ports Corporation, where we stockpile coal before we loaded on the boats to go overseas. So that's where I still am now, uh, driving heavy machinery and unloading the coal wagons, mate. So um, very good job, shift work. Uh, it's actually harder than training and playing footy, actually. So. I was gonna I was gonna ask that question, what's harder, playing in the front row or, or shift and coal? Like it must, it must be very difficult. I know, the sh <laughs> thanks, yeah. Shifting coal is good because you're on an air conditioned machine. And listening to the ABC <laughs> footy and on the Triple M footy, you know, every afternoon uh, that it's on, but uh, it's yeah, the shift works. I thought going out at night, you know, after a game and having an all nighter was easy back then, but now <laughs> having an all nighter working is, is not really good <laughs> at all. <laughs> oh, mate! Well, you've been keeping busy, which is fantastic. And Tony, what about yourself, mate? You moved over to London to the Broncos in '95, and it sounds like you've sort of stayed there. What have you been up to? Yeah, I definitely haven't looked after my temple like, uh, like the Greek <laughs> god over there has looked after his. I've been uh, I've been sitting in a chair most of my life, actually. But uh, I uh, so when I left the, left North, obviously went to London Broncos. When I uh, retired from the Broncos, actually stayed on as chief executive, which was a funny career path. But I jumped straight out of the boots and into the suit um, as chief executive of London Broncos. Then I uh, then I was. Uh, by filling in and working with Kissy, I least Kiss a couple of times as coach, I ended up coaching the team. And so I coached there for, I forget how long, seven or eight years, and then went down and coached at the Brumbies uh, in Super Rugby. And when I was at Brumbies, I actually did a bit of work corporately uh, with Deloitte in Australia and a few other groups where I did a bit of corporate coaching. So I started my own business, which brought me back to London, where I uh, did some corporate co corporate work, you know, performance using the using the sport analogies and improving business, all of those things that you know we classic 
basically see. And then uh, of recent times, uh, through one of my partnerships, I've been working, I work in a placement agency with another with another guy up here repairing. We basically uh, raise capital for funds for, for, for a crust. So we work on behalf of funds and we, uh, we get investors to invest into their funds. That's what I do for a living now here in London. Very interesting. A lot different to a lot different, a lot, lot different to what the temple is doing up there, throwing his weight around. Well, it just goes to show many different types of rugby league players, and yeah, where it's a game for all. So, fantastic, fantastic stuff, gentlemen. I'm interested to hear some of the memories you played together for five or six years. Was there anything you recall from the old days together, Gary, um, or anything you remember about playing with Tony? Playing with Tony, uh, it, it was actually good. Uh, you know, because Tony is from Bundaberg, and so we sort of like a, had a common interest in the area we came from. Both Les, Tony, and myself are from the Wide Bay area. Uh, so, you know, some really good footballers coming out of the Wide Bay area in, in, in regional Queensland. And um, I started my career off. Um, you know, I had a bung knee. I was I was I was in a cast. I had a knee, um, knee reconstruction ACL. So I sat most of the off season out and was watching these blokes run around the field and jumping in a bit. But as far as anything, we were a really close knit group. As far as um, you know, Tony and Les, and they, they looked after me really well. All the country boys that went the north, we sort of like had each other's back and we looked after each other. And um, you know, sometimes it's, you, you walk into an environment like that and all this, all this. All the city lads are thinking, you know, you know, here comes another bloke to try his luck. But, um, yeah, no, we, I thought we held our own. And, look, you know, playing with Tony, and, you know, he was a leader. Yeah, he was a born leader. And all we had to do was the hard work during the week and turn up on the weekend, and he led the team around very well. And that's, you know, that's, that's what I'll say about Tony. And what, is, what are some of your memories, Tony? I mean, you guys were part of the club. That was really building into something special, and that that sort of mid '90s was a good era for the Bears, and it's probably probably attributed to the work that you guys did. Do you have any any fond memories from those days? Oh, very much. And uh, you know, Larry and I lived together. Actually, is where a lot of the oh, really? bond actually come. You know, we lived together off the field, so we spent a lot of time. Oh, I was going to say that. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Cleaned up after him on and off the field, if you know him. But, uh, <laughs> but he, you know, Larry was incredible to play with. He was, I also could clearly see, funnily enough, Larry's journey. He's talked about that knee injury. I can still see, uh, I'll tell you a quick one, and what, what, you know, probably sums up where Gary got going and never got, you know, got, got really flying. I remember uh, we were first grade, Larry was coming back. He was a centre and he was coming back through uh, second grade and they put him in the back row. It was, I remember a really cold, wet, uh, night of training, North Sydney Oval number two were up there, and it was uh, the first grade wasn't going terrific, I've got to say. And then uh, we were playing in a post session, it was supposed to be a bit of grab, you know, sort of Marty Bellery and French, that sort of era was in that team coming through. And Larry kept getting the ball and ripping in and going over the top of people, it was supposed to be grabbing, he's barging people out of the way, and he's running and he was ripping and he was tearing us apart. He's just this young bloke coming back from a knee injury. And I remember. Uh, Frank Stanton stopped the session. He said, right, get in here, you lot. You know, Larson, you get over there, stand there. And you could see all the senior blokes going, yeah, about time someone sorted this peanut out, <laughs> running around, hitting over the top of us, taking this too serious sort of thing. And he's got, uh, right, Larson, you stand there. He said, you're the first bloke picked for next weekend. You're in first grade now, son. The rest of you sort this out. Nine games later, he played Origin, Larry. You know, he just wow. he went from, the mo from that moment on. He just ripped in. He tore in. He was... He, he turned the club around a bit. He doesn't know he did it, but he just, his whole attitude was like, that's what you had to do. He shook the place up. And he was ideal for, from playing with him, I remember, you know, as a dummy half coming out, you go out from dummy half and we sort of play over the advantage line. And I just always knew he was there. He just had that incredible inertia where he just, you come out of the line and he hit the ball and he just hit it hard. And then I think, you know, the, the team things I remember about this how was, was how good the combinations were in those times. It was it wasn't it wasn't last and it was last and fairly and more. It was the four of them, the, the three of them together in the back row, and you had sort of you know Soto and, and Jason Martin, Jacko combining at halves, and, and you know Flo in the centres, and we had sort of great combinations as we we played through that team when we built it out, but. The club had to be rebuilt. And it was when people like Larry come in and put their hands up and started playing like that, that, you know, I've got to be honest, when I first got there, it was, you know, 
Larry's right. It was a bit of a basket case, Norse. You know, there was lots of great names and lots of good reputations. And, and we had to turn it around. We took, it took a lot of turning around. And, you know, you don't do it without the people. You know, the people were the key to get it there. And so we had the right people in the right spots. And Larry was just a quiet bloke, always last off the field, you know, very thorough in his preparation. He was very thorough about everything. There's Kate. Hey, Kate, how are you going? Oh, no. then, uh, they're, <laughs> they're uh, yeah, fantastic, fantastic group of players. And he was uh, <laughs> a very easy bloke to lead, put it that way. He says about leading. And so you get out and lead. And when you're both like that following, it was it was, it was a terrific environment. I keep hearing about how great the team was and how great, how solid, you know, the, the Can the I just jump in was. there, Michael, before, yeah. you, before you go too far? I saw Kate there. One of my favourite Larry's was at Billy Moore's place after a party one time. You've probably heard this one. <laughs> We had a particular, we're like, you know where I'm going, Larry, don't you? And Kate was egging him on. I couldn't find Larry. We're looking around everywhere. And Larry had gone into the bathtub and he was sitting in the bath having a bath. Like, who does that? I mean, there's 50 people in Billy's Moor place having a party and he's sitting there steamed up baths. Kate eggs him on. Larry just gets out and walks straight through the middle of the party in the nude, bubbles <laughs> hanging off him. This Greek guy walks through the middle of the party, turned the volume of the, the he turned the volume of the stereo down. <laughs> well, I think every bloke in the room was looking at their wife to see where they were looking because this bloke walking through the room it was just so that was our spirit and fun, you know. It was just a great group that you could do those things together and no one batted an eye and yeah. everyone just laughed and, you know, and summed it up that Kate was laughing louder than louder than anyone. Is also a terrific person and a great part of us. Larry, well, going to answer that? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, no comment. But I'm glad there weren't any phones around in those days. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, that, was, that, was a good, that was a good thing about league then and sport then. You know, it was only the late 80s and mid early, early 90s. We could do our own thing and probably we could get away with a little bit more than what they can today, but... Um, and that 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 built that built our team too. You know, the the stuff we used to do that that no one else saw, and um, yeah, it, it was a happy environment. And um, yeah, he, he's right. I, I, Tony keeps calling me Larry Michael. I'll I'll go over that quickly if you don't mind. I, oh. Larry Garson. The name Larry Garson was really Gary Larson swapped around. But um, in a first trainer session, uh, there's a couple of gentlemen by the name of uh, Steve Bornhofen and Fred Teasdale. And they sort of like took me under their wing a little bit. And they, were, they were great blokes, lovely blokes. Bornhofen, they're good clubmen. Um, and, and Tony would agree with that. They, they were just the life of the party and, and they could play footy too. Um, and their motto was sort of like party hard and, and train hard, and they, they did that. They, they they gave it to themselves. But one of the things we used to have in you know, are nicknames. Everyone had to have a nickname. I didn't have a nickname, and I, I'm pretty sure it was Freddie Teasdale said, "Oh well, last day we'll just call you Larry Garson. We'll just instead of Gary, we'll call you Larry and, and G." go to the gas and so let's call you Larry Garza and it just stuck and I'd come across quite a few ex-footballers that I played with and against and they'll call me Larry and I'm, I'll be around people and I'll think well where's Larry come from and I try and explain it to them and I'll get too long-winded conversations that uh, <laughs> but that's where Larry comes from mate Fred Teasdale and Steve Hall Steve Born off and Hanson <laughs> and it's stuck, stuck in the city. And, uh, yeah, I know Tony calls me Larry often than not. Yeah. That's awesome. What was Tony's nickname, Gary? <laughs> Snipper. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that there. But but where I do, no, I want to go back to that. I want to go back to that. I want to go back to that bathtub incident at Billy Moore's house <laughs> because uh, because mate, I'm not surprised to hear it, Gary. After speaking to Greg Florimo, he mentioned that you had a tendency for nude driving, mate. Can you tell us anything about that? <laughs> Oh, dear me. Oh, you know, sometimes, um, yeah, you, you, you could just get away with that. And uh, I, think, I think it was my wife, actually. I'll blame it on her. Let's, I'll throw that one to my wife. And uh, uh, she liked to get a new driving every now and then. So we just got nude in, in a little VW that she had one night and driving home. And yeah, and I think we were seen by a couple of players leaving the club. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, the, 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 bath, the bathtub incident was more okay. So I think we I think we come back from Canberra or from Wollongong or somewhere. And it was a cold, normal cold night in Sydney, and everyone else was in the in the in the lounge room of Billy's little house enjoying themselves. And I opened his bathroom. He had a lovely bathroom, a big old uh, <laughs> uh, cast cast iron. Uh, 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 well, I can still see it, mate. Fill it up and jump in. <laughs> <laughs> and jump in and just relax for a while and close the door and come out steaming. Yeah, that, that was Why it. not? No Why good, not, no I good. think? Yeah. Tony, you mentioned no earlier yeah. living, living together with Gary. And um, I don't know if it was about the same time that David Fairley used to sleep over every second night. But uh, we heard a story that uh, Dave Fairley, of course, lived at, with his parents on the Central Coast. So he'd He'd sleep over your place every second night and he's probably watching now. So I'm wondering if, uh, if he owes you any rent, maybe now's a good time to, to send him a message. The big 12 heads. Yeah, he was, uh, <laughs> yeah, he was, he was, he was terrific Daisy. That, that sort of things we did. They, he was in central coast. And anytime there was a function, he used to come down and, and bunk in with us. And it wasn't only him. It'd be Danny Williams and Craig Makepeace. It'd be all those blokes from the central coast. It'd be a thousand of them jumping on the floor and they'd be at our place between training and all that and uh, never paid his way. You're right. So I see why that one's been brought up. Too good, too good. Guys, I want to get serious for a moment as well because you both, um, you're both around for the Super League era, which is an era that interests me a lot. I was growing up in those days and, and I've got the memories there. But Gary, you're there. You're, you're here you know, you stayed loyal to the ARL and you and you stayed loyal to the Bears. And Tony, you moved over to 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 England, where of course Super League played a big part as well. So I'm really interested to hear, you know, what what both your opinions of the time were, what it was like being a rugby league player here in Australia, Gary, during that time. And and then Tony, I'll get your opinion on what it was like over in the UK at the same time. Because I, I have a feeling it was a little bit different, maybe. I, 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 um, I, I suppose look, I, 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 well, I did pretty well out of it. Um, I wish I'd have done better out of it compared to what some of the players are getting paid now. That really irks me. And um, I suppose, you know, pre previous players to me, I, I talk about, you know, players like Brett Kenny in that era, Ray Price, you know, you, you look at the efforts they put in, uh, compared to the efforts we put in and compared to the efforts players are putting in today. It's, it's a cruel world, you know, the, the poor buggers, you know, the, what, what previous players are going through and what some, some are you know, broke and some are going through health issues and all that sort of stuff. But look, get back to the, the, the Super League era. Um, yeah, it, 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 was a, it was a big distraction, but we all had to make a decision on which which competition we wanted to play in. Uh, it, it, it based, and to be honest with you, it came down to who was throwing out, throwing, throwing towards you the most money. That's that's what it come down to. And um, uh, I remember we were at a training session uh, one, I think it might have been a Tuesday night. Um, a couple of the boys had already been into ARL headquarters uh, um, and there was Jeff Carr and um, Bill Gould. I think it might have been Kenny Kenny Arthurson. They was they were they were telling clubs to get players into the ARL to to, to sign up, and if they didn't, they'd miss out on you know, on the big money. Uh, I think we uh, Steve Martin at the time. Uh, Said to us, boys, uh, Steve, what, no, what is it? Peter Louis. No, sorry, it was Peter Louis, 95. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Peter Louis, sorry. And um, he, uh, we, we all jumped in our cars and we all drove into ARL headquarters and we're waiting around there, waiting for our turn to go in and get signed up by the ARL. Because I think basically we'd, the club had um, uh, discussed whether we'd go Super League ARL and we all discussed to stay with the ARL. And there was a group of players that wanted to go to the Super League. Now, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And had we gone to Super League, what would have ended up? Um, 
would we have been our own entity still? Or had we gone down the gurgle like the other Super League clubs? Um, I think we made the right decision. Um, and I'm glad. I'm glad I stayed with the ARL. I, yeah, I've got no, no, no problems with it. It's interesting you say the, that. Yeah, Tony, well, I was sorry. on the other side of the word. Sorry, Mike, what were you going to say? No, that's okay. I'm interested to hear your, your, your opinion on, from your side of the world as well. Yeah, I'd already gone. Actually, I'd already gone to London, so I wasn't sort of ever part of any of those conversations other than these blokes ringing, you know, ringing for chats from 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 London. I was uh, I was of the absolute opposite opinion. I thought North Sydney was ideal for Super League. I just could picture what the Super League was talking about, and I thought North Sydney Oval on Friday nights and, and, and an adjusted competition. To be honest, and anything to break away from Manly, I thought was important, and I thought, actually, I thought we were even some of the leaders at the club at the time were too close to Manly and a little bit influenced by what was going on there, and I just didn't... Personally, I was my, you know, I was sort of thinking. I got why I got the bit with the NRL and being a foundation club, and, and you need to do those strong things. I just thought the what North Sydney was doing at the time and needed the time I felt was tailor made for Super League. I, you know, I felt also I thought it was very difficult for the blokes. You know, you got to. This is not a theory. This is your life sat in front of you, and these blokes are making pretty life changing decisions. And and you know really at a moment, lifetime opportunities right in front of you. Cut it back to the individual. Hey, one bloke ring me, you know, and he said, look, I, I don't know what's going on with all this stuff. He said, but I, I went to train in the day. I had a meeting. I called into a meeting. We jumped in the car. The, you know, the car was Larry Tillman. We went into the NRL. We got given a, a check. He said, I've just gone and bought a house, you know, in the place I always wanted to buy on the waterfront. I'm going back to training tomorrow. He said, oh, nothing's changed for me, but everything's changed in my world. And I thought, well, Imagine getting that in any other walk of life, anything going along. That's cool, you know, guys, there was no support around them and it was rushed and it was hurried and, you know, and all those things going on. So I always think it's difficult to have a big opinion on the players there. I always thought it was more about the leaders in the joint needed to be sitting back and having a look at it. And then again, it's easy from afar. I was sitting there uncluttered, sitting in London, looking at it, really caring about the joint, wondering what they were doing. And I just... I sort of remember, you know, right doing re- and ringing a couple of the leaders at the time, you know, saying what I thought the place should go. But, you know, equally, it's easy when you're out of the dust, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, I think I do think if we'd have done that, you know, we would have we would have kept our identity and, and we would have been in a stronger place. But as Larry said, hindsight's a genius on it. And, um, difficult era for the club. It was, you know, it was a whole era that actually put us in a position where we've got to kick start again soon, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting times, and I'm I'm always fascinated to hear the the alternating opinions of the time as well. And it sort of led us to '99, Gary. You had your final year with the Bears, and I think um, I think you you ended with Parramatta, which I'm not sure if that's the way you would have wanted it to go down. But of course, the Bears and the and the Eagles merged, and we all remember remember that. Was that really was was that merger sort of behind your decision to, to sort of leave the area and end your career with the Eagles instead? Um, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't approached by the... the um, uh, uh, forget what they were even called now. The Manly Morse uh, Syndicate. Um, I was told I wasn't wanted, so then I just started looking elsewhere. Uh, Michael, so I, I could have... Was very close to going to East, but I decided yep. to go to Panama. Because I knew a few of the guys, knew, and it was because I'd, I'd been on the World Cup in '95 with Jimmy Dimmick, um, and, and uh, uh, there were a couple of Queenslanders there, and Stewie Kelly, um, PJ Marsh, um, you know, lads from around my area in the central Queensland area, uh, and and you know Brian Smith, uh, uh, a great coach. I thought he was a very good coach. Um, Maybe something I should have done earlier in my time is, is maybe go to a different coach, but I enjoyed my time in North City. I mean, no, no problems yep. with, with that. Um, but it was, I had a, I wish I was younger and had made that decision earlier. And under, under a different coach, Brian Smith taught me a fair bit about the game. Uh, personally, he told me I couldn't tackle properly. And so um, he readjusted my tackle technique. Wow. And, 
at the age of 33, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> and uh, I did, I did. I spent a lot of time with Daniel Anderson and, and coaching staff and um, to try and change that, change my ways a bit. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, I was getting 33 and getting slow. Uh, getting, I had a couple of injuries at North, at, sorry, at Parramatta that I'd never, never really had many um, m- muscular injuries at North, like strained hamstrings, et cetera. Um, and I thought, no, it's time to give it up. And so I just yeah, faded away into the into the sunset, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, so I enjoyed my time at Parramatta. And um, um, and there were young blokes there, like young Nathan Hindmarsh at the time coming through, and um, Nathan Kalis. And I hopefully, you know, I showed them a, a thing or two when I was there. Oh, well, they did, mate. I'm interested about the tackling technique. What were? What can you explain? <laughs> maybe one of the tweaks, one or two of the tweaks uh, there. Just for anyone at home. Uh, yeah, basically, is uh, I was getting lazy and um, okay. <laughs> I wasn't uh, I wasn't uh, getting in close enough. So I had to uh, adjust my footwork a little bit. So uh, and it did. It came good. Like you can teach an old dog new tricks, Michael. So yeah, it, it came good and. Um, yeah, I finished off pretty pretty well out there. Yeah, yeah you certainly did. We've been mate. telling him for years, Michael. He just wouldn't listen. <laughs> it took Brian Smith. It took Brian. Well, gentlemen, it's been Brian, great. Listen, Brian, think... <laughs> sorry, but Brian Smith was uh, was a was a good coach, and uh, I think a lot of the young blokes just didn't know how to take him. Uh, whereas an old dog, I just did what I was told, and that's what you do. Uh, um, uh, if a coach, coach tells you to jump you say how high and that's it that's the way i was brought up that's That's awesome uh, they might be different now as well gary but um gentlemen it's been great catching up hearing the bands i love hearing the stories i I wish we had more time sometimes but i think the fans i I wish I, i believe the fans would love seeing you both wearing your bears gear know that your heart is still with the club and, uh, you know, know that the, the club has a bright future because of guys like yourself. So thank you very much for uh, joining me for this episode of Bears Banter. Pleasure, Michael. Great yeah. to be back. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michael. And uh, take care, Tony. Say good day to Sarah. You too, mate. Thanks for the invite, guys. Much appreciated. Love to Kate and the team, Gary. Will do, mate. You too. Take it easy. See you, mate. I, know, I walked into a bar one night at Manly and we played a, ga- a game on the ABC, actually a Sunday afternoon game. And this bloke came up to me and his shirt fronts me. He said, hey, they, they don't call you a sniffer because you sniff out a try like Warren Boland said on the telly. <laughs> I said, well, I didn't call myself that because it's, you know, every year I'd score two tries. So how could we sniff from sniffing our tries? Yeah. But what happened was I, when I went from Brisbane, from Bundaberg to Brisbane, I uh, went to Brisbane Brothers and I didn't know anyone in the club. And I played, I was a bit of a footy head, and we played under 18s on the Saturday, and first, second, and third grade was always on the Sunday. And I'd go off on the Sunday and uh, watch the games, and but all my under 18 mates were big drinkers, and they'd go off, they'd go off uh, partying all day Sunday, wouldn't come. So I'd go back to the club after because I was a footy head, and I'd sit with a bloke called Tony Byrne, who was from Bundaberg, and his missus and her little sister. I'd sit there, and there's the, and then she was quite cute. And as the night would go on every Sunday night, Burns here go off with the boys, Jackie would go off with the girls, and I'd stay there with this this, this sister. <laughs> and uh, then then halfway during the year I was there, I got called from under 18s in the first grade. It was a bit of a shock. And at the time on the Tuesday afternoons, they used to read out teams on a Monday and they list them on a Tuesday. Sorry, you're training on a Tuesday. I went onto the field of brothers and they go, you know, reserve grade, you're up in the gym, under 18, you're on field three, under 21, you're on field two. It was a bit like that, if you could picture it. And first grade stay on the field and I'm there. And Robert Grogan was the centre and he goes, what are you doing, mate? You blokes are on the backfield. I said, oh, no, I'm in first grade this week, mate. I'm here. He goes, oh, you Tony Ray, are you? Like this. He goes, yeah. Oh, hey boys, this is him. This is Tony Ray here. This is that dirty sniffer dog that's always sniffing around Burnsy's little sister. <laughs> <laughs> so I went over my first ever entry into first grade to say, It was sniffer dog, come here, sniffer dog, go, sniffer dog, go. <laughs> <laughs>
No one knew my name in the end anyway. They said, what's that sniffer dog's name by the end of it? <laughs> we got back to it. And then sniffer stuck. <laughs>